All right, yeah, so Kai is using an indicator from Ninjacators. Uh, it is the um, RSD indicator, which is the real-time supply and demand indicator. So uh, this indicator is going to put horizontal supply and demand lines on. And so Kai wants to know um, how to get a signal when price... Um, moves out of a strong supply and demand zone. Um, all right, so Kai, um, I can't use the RSD in this room because it is a proprietary indicator uh, for sale. So I can't, um, I can only use free indicators um, available uh, because if, uh, you know, because these templates that I make in these workshops, you know, it, when, if someone asks for these templates and if they don't have the RSD indicator installed then this template's going to give them a bunch of errors so I need to use indicators that are freely available so at least everybody has the opportunity to download the, and install the indicators into their NinjaTrader before they open up these Bloodhound um, templates here but what I can do is I can use Ninja's Pivot indicator to illustrate um, how to do that um, so so yeah so Kai what you're going to use would be the crossover solver for that um, all right so let's see all right give me a moment and I'm gonna um, put a couple of indicators on my chart so I'm just going to use Ninja's Pivot Indicator because everybody has that. And uh, there we go. Don't know why I couldn't find it. Um, all right. Um, so with Ninja's Pivot Indicator, let's see. You, you do have to set it on Calc from Intraday Data. So this is a little flaw within Ninja Trader. Um, hopefully they get this fixed in Ninja 8. So, um, all right, so we'll look at daily pivots and we're going to calculate from intraday data. And let's see here. And, oh, no wonder, my chart is on daily data. Okay, let's, um, let's go put this on a five range. All right, so there's a pivot line. So I need to find a point where price crosses that pivot line. Um, all right, here's the spot. All right, guys, so this um, isn't going to be exactly like using the RSD. Uh, so if for, for those who don't know uh, about the RSD, uh, it plots a zone area like this. Uh, actually, let me draw it a different way. All right, so the RSD, you know, kind of draws this a zone type of an area um, right so there's actually two lines to every zone so you do have to know which you know which um, which line you're working with which line you want to work with you know is it the upper plot or is it the lower um, plot line right uh, so so that's why this is not going to be a perfect example because you know the pivot indicator only has one plot line it's pretty simple but the RSD is going to have two lines for a zone right the upper line and lower line so so you'll have so I can show you which solver to use and you'll probably have to set up you're going to have to set up multiple crossover solvers uh, you know looking at um, looking at either the upper or the lower whichever part of the zone you're you're looking for price to be you know breaking out of right 
So, all right. So let's get things started here with Bloodhound. So first thing I need to do is give this a name, and it is the ninth. All right. Okay. So there's today's uh, Bloodhound template. And let's see, I'm just going to start working on the logic board here. And let's see. All right, so um, I'll just. Uh, Call it supply and demand uh, zone break. So let's grab a crossover solver. All right. So connect our solver up so that way we can see what's happening as we're building this solver. Let's see. So we're uh, looking for price to basically cross one of the uh, supplier demand zone lines. All right, so we so the first thing we want to use is price. So indicator A is going to be price. So we're going to be looking for price to cross the indicator plot, one of the indicator right uh, zone lines. So uh, so down here in B, I'm going to set this to the indicator. So in this case, or I'm using the pivots. All right, uh, so you do need to go in here and make sure that all your parameters are set up exactly the same way as they are on the chart. So I need to change this to calc from intraday. Um, let's see, this width, uh, the width parameter doesn't actually affect how the indicator calculates, right? It just affects how it draws on the chart. Um, so in reality, I don't really need to adjust this, the width, but you know, these two parameters do affect how the indicator calculates. So, um, all right, so next uh, we have all of these zones, so to speak, right? So this is kind of similar to the RSD in that, right, there's gonna be multiple plots here, or I think in the case of the RSD indicator, they're actually gonna be data series, um, but think of them as, um, you know, plots or data series uh, in this uh, in this case is going to be one and the same here. So what I need to do is I need to find the plot, you know, that I'm working with here on my chart. So um, right, so in this example, I'm working with the R1, and um, all right, so I'm just going to select the R1, right, and so keep in mind, so we're using the crossover solver, right? So the crossover solver, we can only select one plot at a time. Um, so Kai, you're gonna have to have a crossover solver for each of the zones that you wanna analyze. All right, so um, I, I'll build a couple more solvers here just to kind of give you an example. Um, all right, so when we look at the chart, right, we're going to get long signals when price crosses above, right, the upper zone line, or when price crosses down below it. So we're going to have to decide, um, you know, which which of these do we want. So I'm just, you know, I'm going to decide that we're really looking for um, for the upper zone, right, for the upper zone we'll be looking for price crossing above and we're not we're not interested when price crosses down and into the zone right so what I'm going to do is I'm going to set this solver to oops um, evaluate we want to set the evaluate to long only All right so now we have situations where price crosses out up, up above we're only getting the long signals there. Um, all right, uh, so that would be like one example. And um, 
Um, let's see. Let me find some other pivot lines, and we'll add to this. Actually, maybe I can. I mean, let me look back a day, and maybe find some better examples here. Here, right here's a couple examples. Price crossed the R1. Um, yeah, I'm going to make some adjustments here and hopefully make a better example, at least visually, a better example. So let's just pretend for a moment that this R1 and the PP line is one of the zones. Mm -hmm. Looks like I don't have transparent on this list. All right, I'll just use black. All right, so and let's say we got, you know, we have this zone area and I'm just going to use the R1 and the PP to represent right the upper uh, zone area and the lower zone area All right, so I've got one solver that'll detect um, you know when price crosses above the upper zone uh, and so I'm going to build another crossover solver that will detect you know if price is coming you know coming from below and then crossing down and out like that out of the right out of the lower zone and so we'll use the PP plot for doing that all right scoot the chart over all right let's see before I move on let me I'm gonna rename this solver here this is price um, Crossing above the R1 line. All right, so let me grab another crossover solver. So this will be price crossing below the the PP line all right so we're gonna set this up pretty much the same we're gonna set indicator a to price and we'll set indicator B section here to the indicator all right make sure I change all my parameters to match up and all right we're using the PP line here um, and actually you know what let me let me do this another way here here's a more efficient way um, so I'm gonna take right take the previous crossover solver here let's set it back to both and you know since I changed my example um, I'm going to change the way I set this crossover solver up here. So let's see. I want to generate a short signal when when price crosses the PP line, right? So remember the PP line represents the lower zone area, right? And R1 represents the upper zone area. So when price crosses the upper zone area, I want to generate a long output and when price crosses the lower zone area I want to generate a short output right so I can do that in one solver 
instead of using two. All right, so there, now we can see. That's, there we go. So now we can see when price crosses into the zone and then back out, it's going to generate that short signal like that. All right. Um, so essentially, that's it. Um, all right. So the key here is when you're setting up your your uh, zone indicator down here, you're going to want to select, you know, the plot. Uh, for the upper zone and a plot for the lower zone and then decide you know are you wanting to get a long signal or a short signal from the upper zone line you know and do you, and from the lower zone line do you want to get a long or a short signal um, right so those are just detailed decisions you'll have to make you know depending on how you're using that indicator um, so um, let's see, all right, so Kai, if the crossover solver is not working with that indicator, then there's, um, then probably that indicator is just isn't working correctly. Uh, so the indicators might need to revisit their indicator code and get it working. Um, Let's see, it's not showing you different plots. Um, hmm. Are they, yeah, I don't think they're using plots. I think the RSD is using a data series that represents the upper zones and lower zones. Um, so, um, yeah, so just so you guys know, you know, just because an indicator works on the chart um, doesn't mean it's going to work with Bloodhound, right? It all depends on how the indicator was coded. So NinjaTrader allows, um, allows it, yeah, when you're coding an indicator, there's all kinds of things that you can do. NinjaTrader is pretty much an open source platform. And, you know, that's why a lot of programmers like NinjaTrader, because you can do really you know, fantastic things when you're programming for NinjaTrader's platform, you know, whereas other charting platforms like TradeStation, you're really limited as to what you can do. Um, so, and it, so there's ways that you can write your indicator so that it works great on the chart, but it can be designed in such a way that it won't work inside of a strategy or it won't work inside of another indicator because you know, some people do this just because they don't want people to back engineer their indicators or they don't want people to use their indicators in a, in a, you know, for, in an automated situation. Or some programmers just don't know how to make their indicator really fully compatible for automation type stuff. Um, so, so just the fact that it works on a chart doesn't mean that it was written um, to work in an automated situation properly. Um, so let's see. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So that is one of the ones that's supposed to be working with Bloodhound. Um, hmm. Kai, maybe you have an old version. Um, I know that some of NinjaCator's indicators were definitely um, updated so that they work properly with Bloodhound and they won't crash um, with Bloodhound. Um, so, I guess, yes. Uh, uh, well, okay, yeah, so here's another tip, Kai. Um, it's, it is very important to make sure that you have all your parameters, you know, the parameters that you set in Bloodhound, you know, need to match what you have set on the chart. So that is something that um, people will overlook, right? So the pivots indicator, 
that I have on my chart, you know, from that, from the indicator window, right, you do have to make sure that all the settings match exactly. So um, I know the RSD, I think, is has a lot of options to it. So you, just, you do have to make sure all those options are, are matching correctly. Um, and uh, yeah, just a sec, let me see. I think I can confirm if the RSD was uh, is working correctly with Bloodhound. Let's see. Yeah, so hold on guys, I'm looking for a little documentation here for the Ninjicator. So I have a short list of Ninjicator indicators that uh, are working. Um, so actually Kai, the RSD strategy, so I'm not sure if they have a different RSD indicator, but I have on my list that the RSD strategy actually was not fixed. So it does have problems. Um, and it's not going to work properly in an automated, you know, uh, format, in an automated strategy format. So, Kai, if, you know, Ninjicators told you that it works with Bloodhound, um, they have not confirmed that with me. Um, you know, so I let them know, you know, ask, ask for your money back if, you know, if that's what you want, um, if that, the claims that they made um, yeah if they did fix it to work with Bloodhound they didn't let me know um, so um, yeah you know I I'd be glad um, if they did update that indicator I'd be glad to retest it for them you know just let them know um, and have one of them uh, you know, uh, send me an email. Um, I can't think of, uh, it's been a while since I've talked to those folks over there, but, um, I, you know, I was in contact with a couple of the folks over there on a regular basis, trying to help them get their, uh, their indicators ready for Bloodhound. So I know not, so, then, and they did get a, a handful of indicators ready for Bloodhound. So, but the RSD strategy was not one of them. Right. Um. Ah, it was for free. Okay. Yeah. Um. You know, hey, it it doesn't. Uh, you know, it doesn't hurt to you know ask them if they can uh, fix it so that it works with Bloodhound. You know, and let them know that I'd be glad to help them out with that and work with them on that. So uh, you know, we're always glad to work with other. Ninjicator vendors out there to help them get their indicators compatible with Bloodhound. All right, so we see that as a service for you guys um, that uh, we'd be glad to do. Let's see. All right, Kai. So yeah, I guess uh, I think we're kind of done with this um, as far as the RSD. But um, you know, the way I set this crossover solver up, right, with price being up here in indicator A and indicator B is going to be the indicator right and then you'll just select you know the plot that represents the upper upper level and the plot that represents the lower level right depending on what whether you want long or short signals when price crosses that the upper or lower level but that's uh, conceptually that's how you would do it in Bloodhound right so let's see um let me delete this other one that I'm not using. Let's see. Bruce is asking, can we go over adding the CCI on a 10 brick uh, to use the signal line? Let's see. As a crossover. Let's see. Use the signal line as a crossover versus the zero line of the CCI. Um, all right, I think I understand what Bruce is wanting to do here. So let me go to my chart and set this up. Um, okay. 
Okay, so let's put the CCI on here. All right, so let me I'm read um, Bruce's comment again here. Um, let's see. So, Bruce, what is the signal line? So you're saying you want to use the signal line versus the zero line. Um, so I need to know what's what's the signal line. Um, so um, you know I know some indicators have uh, a smoothing of the main indicator, and that smoothed plot is called the signal line. But the CCI doesn't have a signal line. Um, let's see. Oh, the ergodic. Okay. All right. Let's see if I have that. Let's see. No, I don't have the ergodic. Um, I'll try and get the ergodic on here. All right. So I'm, I'm assuming, Bruce, it's the um, ergodic oscillator. Or the, oh, okay, the ergodic hist. All right. So not that one. We're using this one, the ergodic hist. Um, I guess for histogram. All right, so I'm just going to use whatever the default settings are. So 6, 12, and 34. Let's get this on the chart. And hmm, looks like I need to change some colors here for the black charts. Um, trying to make them a little thicker and easier to read. All right, so what we're looking for is these kind of these crossover points here so <clears throat> I think what Bruce is looking for is you know we want to know if the ergodic plot right the ergodic plot is either above or below the signal line so the white line is the signal line Right, so there's our signal line, and the plot underneath the histogram, that's the actual ergodic line, and then we have a signal line. So we're wanting to see if this is above or below um, one plot or the other. Yeah, so, um, <clears throat> so like in this example, <clears throat> um, this would be a short state. So with the uh, ergodic line below the signal line, that would be a short state. And then over here, where the ergodic line is above the signal line, above the white line, that would be a long state. Uh, let's see. Just looking to see if there's a confirmation from Bruce on that. Um, oh, okay. I see. Um, so Bruce is saying where the yellow dots are. Those are the crossover points. Um, okay. So that adds a little complexity to this because I don't always see, uh, I only see the yellow dots every once in a while. Um, see so Bruce this looks a little confusing here so I have a I guess I mean that to me looks like a, a short state um, and that looks like a short state and there's no yellow dot for the long state I, I'm guessing um, so then the question is this whole area over here um, you know is this in a long or a short stick? Because I don't see any yellow dots. Um, oh, all right. So I think uh, I understand this a little better now. So I guess so. When our indicator is above the zero line, and we get these dots, that puts us in a bearish state, right? I guess that puts us in a bearish state, and. If the indicator is below the zero line and we get a dot, that puts us in a bullish state. Let's see. Uh, here we go. 
I guess that puts us in a bullish state. And I think that puts us in a sell state. Um, okay. Yeah, Bruce is confirming yes, so that would be a, that would be a sell state. Alright, so we've got a couple of sell states there. And this would be a buy state. Uh, there. Alright, and also Bruce has let me know the way he's using this is he's using <clears throat> excuse me, he's using a, a Ranko bar. So we're going to use um, a 10 brick Ranko bar. All right, so let's redraw these again. So there's our, our buy state. And then we go into a sell state, like so. Um, all right. Um, so now that we've kind of got this figured out here, yeah, this will be a good little lesson here. So, all right, so we have some very kind of unique turning points um, identified by this indicator. Um, and so what we need to do is, you know, identify these turning points, you know, or, or where these yellow dots are in these crossover points, we need to I identify that bloodhound and then hold on to that state, right? So this dot, this crossover area, puts us in a long state, and we want to hold on to that long state until a short state occurs, and then we'll flip, right? From a long state, we'll flip to a short state. And so we're going to use a toggle node to do that. All right, so let's get this uh, Bloodhound open here. And uh, I'll make a new template. Oh. Um, let's see. Let's see. So we'll do the ergodic long or short um, state. So that's kind of what we're building here. And let's see. Um, so we're looking for these yellow dots. So I'm going to check, make sure that that, see if that yellow dot is an actual plot. Um, yeah, so I pulled up right the ergodic hist indicator. And if I look at my plots section, right, there's a cross dot right there, labeled cross dot. So I think that pretty well, you know, that cross dot, just the name alone. Um, and also I can see it's set to yellow and the style is dot. So I'm, you know, 99% positive that these yellow dots are going to be this cross dot plot. Right, so I'm going to try and use this plot to identify when those dots show up. Right. Um, so this, just looking at that plot, um, that's not a crossover. Right. So I'm just looking at when that plot shows up. So I'm going to do a little testing here. And this should work with the threshold solver. So this is just going to be a test run to see if this works. And if it doesn't work, then we'll I'll come up with another method here to figure this out. Um, all right, so all right, so we're looking for the ergodic cross dot, like so. So let's change, let's change our indicator here. All right, 
let's see, yeah, just using the standard settings. And we want the cross dot plot. Okay, so there we go. So there's our cross dot. And I just, I'm not really looking to see if the dot is above or below. Well, actually, yeah, I guess I would. Yeah, so the dots are going to be below zero when we're looking for a long state. And the dots will be above zero when we're looking for a short state. So, oops, actually, that's wrong. There we go. So for the long output, right, so for a long output section, we're looking for... We're looking for the indicator to be less than zero. All right, so remember E equals zero. So all of our alphabets here, they all equal zero. So when the indicator is less than zero, I want an output, and there we go. You can see we get an output on that, on that dot. There's another one, a couple more. All right, and we want a short output if if that plot is above zero or greater than zero <clears throat> so there's those all right so good this, this is working out well okay so we can see right so whenever a, a short output occurs then that means we're in a short state you know until we get to a long output and then that'll put us into a long state. So now this is going to be a filter so we need a, a continuous uh, outputs from this. So to get continuous outputs we're going to use the toggle node and the default settings for the toggle node will do exactly what we want. So we won't have to change anything on the toggle node just hook it up. All right. And so there we go. So we're in a long state here until we get our dot up here and then we stay in a short state, right? We're still in a short state because this was another short cross dot. And we're staying in that short state, you know, until we get to, until we get to the next dot over there. <clears throat> All right, so that, I think that's it. Um, so I didn't, I didn't have to change anything on the toggle node. Just use this, the default settings. So all I had to do was just set up a threshold solver there. So there's the settings, Bruce. And um, so give me a moment here while I read through Bruce's comments and see if, uh, if he had anything else up. And okay, yes, yeah, so let me pull up the indicator as well. So there we go. So we're using the cross dot plot. That's what we're looking at uh, with the threshold solver. So remember, the um, this cross dot plot is what's drawing the yellow dots on there. So since Bruce is using the yellow dots to determine, you know, what the trend state is, well then Bloodhound also needs to use that yellow dot, which is the cross dot. Okay, so let's see. Bruce is trying to follow along here. Um, and I'd suggest, um, you know, if you guys are able to, I'd suggest you guys follow along as well. So, all right. Um, so grab a threshold solver. First thing we want to do is right, change our indicator over. So we'll open up the indicator window and you know go find your ergodic indicator. So I've got it right there. Um, you know make any um, parameter changes that are necessary, right? So if you're using different period settings, you know, make those adjustments, change your settings here. And then step three um, is select, you know, the plot that you're looking for. 
um, right? So guys, when you're when you're when you're um, when you're selecting an indicator to use in the solvers, you know, just think of this as a three-step process. So step one is find your indicator. All right. So we found the indicator at step one. Step two is you know make any parameter changes. You know, make any adjustments to your indicator settings. So that way it matches what you're using on the chart. All right, so that's step two is go through this window, make any changes necessary. And then step three is you know go find the plot or go find the data series that you that you're using, that you want to use, and make sure that you select it. I like that. So okay, so that gets your indicator set up. And then the next part is set your thresholds. So in this case, it's just zero. And then the final step is make sure you set your outputs, right? You have to make sure you set these outputs. So Bruce, if you're not getting signals, it's probably because you um, didn't set your outputs there. So let's make sure you set those two outputs. Hmm, okay. Yeah, so Bruce is also using this on a higher time frame. So uh, let's let's um, make that adjustment. All right. So let me put. I'm going to change my chart here. Um, I'll just adjust this down to a five brick chart. <clears throat> so let's get Bloodhound back open. And. So let's see. Bruce is using on a higher time frame. So let's. Um, all right, I'm going to use the Unirenko. So because that's available for free. Um, mm, I'm not sure what settings to use. So. Uh, I guess I'll have to go to the Pro Ranko here. Okay, so I'm going to make a 10 brick Pro Ranko chart. All right, so there's a 10 brick Pro Ranko um, time frame. And so I'm going to take the uh, threshold solver with the ergodic indicator, move it down. So I moved it down underneath the uh, 10 brick Ranko chart time frame. So now, if we switch back over to the logic board, if you look at the solver now, you can see right above here, it says ProRanko 10 brick. All right, so this solver is running on the 10 brick time frame. Uh, and so this indicator is running, the ergodic hist indicator is running on the 10 brick uh, ProRanko chart. Right, although the chart that Bloodhound is running on is is a five brick Renko. All right, so Bloodhound's running on a smaller time frame, but the solver is running on the higher time frame. So, so now what we need to do is um, uh, refresh the chart so we can get NinjaTrader to build that ten brick data that we need. And let's look. Okay, so there we go. So, right, so this long and short state is being calculated from the 10 brick, the higher time frame. All right, uh, so there you go, Bruce. I think that about completes it. Um, so let me move on and answer some other people's questions on here. Okay, yeah, so Kai was asking, is it possible to use the VWAP in the slope indicator? Uh, I would certainly think so. So, all right, let me open up today's workshop file again. Okay, there we go. All right, and so keep in mind whenever you open up, whenever you open a new file in Bloodhound, we do need to refresh the chart so we can get all that data built. There we go. Uh, 
All right. Um, all right. So we're using the VLAMP from the NTS form here. Okay. So you'll notice um, <clears throat> under my solver nodes here, you'll notice I have several different options now, right? I've got existing nodes, stuff that I've already built, and you'll see there's two different time frames, right? So I have solvers that are on the default time frame, and I have solvers that's on this 10 brick Pro Renko, right? And you'll also see, so I, I can create a new solver on the default time frame, or I can create a new solver on the uh, Pro Renko 10 brick. Right, so I'm going to go to the default time frame. So the default time frame is the chart, right? The chart that I have open, that the chart that I have Bloodhound on. So let's grab an indicator slope from the default time frame. Plug that in there. All right, and we're going to change the um, SMA to a VWAP. So let me just change the name here first. Right, just put in VWAP. Okay, and let's go find that VWAP indicator. Here we go. All right, and there are no parameters to this. Pretty simple indicator. And uh, so our, our plots are already selected for us. And there we go. It's uh, just that simple. This indicator, while wow, it really does not um, it looks almost flat all the time but uh, when it is sloping up ever so slightly right you're gonna get a long output uh, if it's sloping down ever so slightly you'll get a short output uh, so there you go Kai it looks like it works fine let's see um, I guess for lack uh, lack of a better name, I'm just going to call this like the Bollinger Cross In. Um, right? Bollinger Cross In signal. <clears throat> okay. Um, let's see. Yeah, this, this should be pretty simple. Uh, all right. So I'm going to go to the default time frame. Grab a crossover solver. All right. So remember, the default time frame is always. <clears throat> it's always the chart that Bloodhound is running on. So, so our default default time frame in, in this case is the five range for now. All right, let's connect this solver up, and so we're looking for price to cross over. The Bollinger, the Bollinger bands. So let's set, let's set uh, this to price, <clears throat> and we're going to set indicator B to the Bollinger band. And let's see, on the chart, I'm actually using 1 and 2. So let's change that to, I'm sorry, 1 and 14. All right, so let's take a look at our chart here. Um, when price is crossing above the lower band, we're looking for a long output, right, a long situation. So we're going to use the lower band to generate a long cross up. And we're going to use the upper band to generate a short cross down, right? So the upper band is going to generate a short output. So there's our signals, right? Lots of them. So there's the entries, right? So it's just that basic as, you know, as far as the rules that uh, we have here. Um, and then uh, the exit, all right, let's, uh, let's see, I'm going to rename this here. All right, so that's our entry. So let's make a new logic template. 
and that is our this will be our exit right and let's see I just need yeah I just need another crossover so grab that crossover and Okay, so there we go. So this solver, so this crossover solver is going to be almost identical. Um, we're going to set A to, to price again. This, and then this time, we're going to set up the Bollinger a little different. So, <clears throat> um, Let's see. Oh, need to change my indicator settings here. There we go. And let's see. Yes. Yeah, so this is going to be a little backwards. Let's see. So um, <clears throat> yeah. So when price crosses. We're looking for price, so the exit signal is going to be when price crosses the upper band, right? So if price is crossing the upper band, it's always, you know, it's going to be crossing up. Um, and you can't, so crossing up is always kind of a long cross situation. Um, so we can't generate a short signal from this, which is what we want. But we do have, to, but we can generate a long cross up. When price crosses above the upper band, and when price crosses below the lower band, uh, we can generate uh, a short when price crosses the lower band. All right, there we go. So there's um, there's our signals, but we have to reverse these, right? So this this is the exit signal. So we actually right. So if we're in in a long trade here we need to generate a short signal to exit that trade. Um, so we want, um, let's see here, let's change our outputs. And, uh, okay, change the outputs and Oh, I need to go in here and change the plots. Let me flip these. There we go. All right. So with the crossover solver, I had to change my output. So instead of using crossing in direction, I'm using crosses against direction. So that's that's the condition that that we set to one. And then I actually had to go in here and um, flip flip my plots that I'm using here. So actually, we are using the upper band to generate a short signal. So we can see right here, right price crossed the upper band and generated a short signal. So that will exit the trade. And then over here on the left side of the chart, when price crosses below the lower band that'll generate a, sh a long signal and that long signal will exit this short trade all right so let's draw another arrow right so there's our there's our our short trade all right so let's look at the entry so there's the entry signals all right there's our entry signal and there's our entry signal. <clears throat> and then we'll switch over to the exits, exit logic. All right, and then there's our exit signal. And our other exit signal. All right, Ken, uh, I, I take it that that's what you were looking for. 
Kai's asking, how is it possible to create a signal at the turning point of a slope? Um, so when the slope of the rising EMA 55 begins to decrease, uh, is it the rise decreases or when the indicator actually reverses down? Um, so, so not the high or the low of an amplitude. Um, let's see. Okay. Um, yeah, so let, uh, let's see here. Let's put a moving average on here for Kai. Um, Okay, let's get an EMA on the chart. And make it an EMA 55. And it's, it's gonna be our red line on the chart. So there's our red line on the chart. So let's, uh, let me shrink things up here a little bit. Um, okay, so Kai, I take it what you're looking for is it that reversal point right there? And let's see, this reversal point right there? Um, okay, no, it's not that. Um, ah, okay, so, okay, so when the rise decreases, okay, yes, okay. Um, okay, gotcha. All right, so. Kai, what I'm going to do is instead of using the EMA, I'm going to use the stochastics because it's visually the stochastics is much easier to see on the chart. But you know, moving averages, trying to visually see when when the slope is flattening out, that's very that's a lot difficult, to, more difficult to see with a moving average. So let me add a stochastics on here. drawing aids on the chart so you can see um, <clears throat> as the as our stochastics kind of turns and we can see that the the slope is increasing right the slope is increasing so it's the indicator is rising faster and faster um, and I'm trying to illustrate that with these arrows right it's just rising faster and faster until we get to this point and then we can see that the the indicator it's still rising but the indicator is not rising as fast right the indicators are starting to uh, kind of fall over right so uh, the indicator is starting to flatten out right so we can see the indicator is beginning to kind of flatten out even though it's still rising but it's flattening out like that so this is what Kai is trying to detect is when is this indicator beginning to flatten out? Uh, so let's see. So, um, so there we go. So I put a little dot on the bar where it's actually beginning to flatten out. <clears throat> okay. So Bloodhound can do that. All right, so what we're looking for is a change in um, slope. So we're trying to detect a, a change in slope, a change in the degree of slope to be more precise. Um, so uh, let me, I'm going to I'm going to show something here. This is not what Kai is asking for, but I'm just showing an illustration. Uh, so let me get the stochastics indicator loaded.
Okay, so a change in slope is not these reversal points. Right, so you can right, you can see these reversal points there. So these reversal points is not a change in slope. These are inflection points. Right, so you would use the inflection solver to detect these inflection points or or you know these reversal points. <clears throat> right, so what you're looking at right now is the inflection indicator. Um sorry, inflection solver. So it's the indicator inflection solver. That's what you're looking at right now. And that's not what Kai's talking about. He's actually looking for a change in slope. Okay, so that's a little different. <clears throat> actually, it's uh, quite a bit different. So let's put our stochastics in here. And let me change the name here. All right, so we're looking for the stochastics change in slope. All right, so the key to using this indicator is knowing which of these outputs you want to use. Um, so what Kai is wanting to use is number two, <clears throat> item number two. So I'm going to zero everything out. And so I'm going to set number two, which is in direction but turning, or another way you could say this is in it's you know in this in the direction but flattening, um, right? So let's go back to here, um, and oh, actually, okay. So actually, the um, stochastics starting to flatten back a little bit. Uh, see, it it is visually. It is pretty difficult for us to see these areas where an indicator is starting to flatten. Um, you know, it actually started to flatten right there too. Um, and it was it's very difficult to see it, but mathematically, if you do the calculations, which you know the computer is doing the calculations, it's finding where where the stochastics began to flatten out. So this is the first bar where the flattening happens. Um, and so we can see right there, I guess that that's, you know, I'd say that's pretty easy for us to, to, to see that um, the stochastic's turning up pretty good and then it's starting to flatten right there. And then it started to roll over even more, right? Um, so let me pull up a, a graphics image to help us understand what each of these outputs are doing, right? So you can see there's six different outputs. And um, so the question becomes, how do you know which one of these you want to do? Or, or which one of these you do you want to use, right? And of course, you could just, you know, sit here and just kind of play around with it. Um, but, you know, uh, usually for most people, it doesn't quite make sense right off the bat. But there is a graphical image that explains what each of these numbered outputs do. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to help, right? And we're going to go to documentation. So let's go to the documentation. <clears throat> All right, so we're at the documentation page. And on the right side menu, we're going to go down to Bloodhound Reference. And then you'll see there's a solvers here, right? Confidence solvers. So here's a list of all those solvers. And we want to go to right here, change in slope. So let's find the change in slope one. Click on it. And here's the change in slope documentation. All right. So you can scroll down, and there's all the all the written documentation. So like here's a written explanation of the outputs, right? Here's the output section. So here's Number one, and so there's a written description of what number one is, and there's a written description of number two. 
Now, if we scroll down, here is the graphical image I wanted to show you guys. All right. I can open that up, make it a little bigger. So you see how we have these uh, green and red dots, right? So these green and red dots, right, they're numbered. So number one, the number one dot green is the is the number one output. So let, let me uh, shrink this up. Right, so number one, green, green number one is going to apply to this number one output. And so we're going to get a long, so notice the, the green buttons are for the long output, the red ones are for the short output. All right, so the green, green number one, you're going to get an output when your indicator is rising, when it's increasing in its rate of rise. So you see how the, the black line is increasing in its rate of rise? And then right here in the middle, the indicator begins to flatten out, right? The indicator is still rising, but it's flattening out. So number one is this area, right? And for the short output, you see number one's over here, right? And that's because the indicator is now falling, right? It's, it's, um, it's, uh, it, yeah, it's basically turned down. It's sloping down. It's falling and it's increasing in its rate of fall. Right, so let's, um, let me change this indicator and I'll point out number one. And so let's look at, uh, yeah, look at the chart here, right? So you'll notice right here's our green area and you see how it kind of matches the, uh, matches that image. And let me just make a little adjustment here. There we go. Right, so this is, so our indicator is rising like so. Um, there we go, yep, so you see the number one button is showing the indicator is rising like that. And, um, and then this area here, we can see the stochastic is, now it's falling and it's increasing in its fall rate, right? And so the number, the red number one button is showing the indicator falling like this, right? Um, <clears throat> and so what Kai is interested in is the number two button. Uh, so let's set that back to zero, and we'll set number two to two, the number two to one or turn the number two plot on, output on, right? So the number two is, it's this very first bar, right? This very first area where the indicator begins to flatten out, right? So the indicator is still rising. It's still sloping up, but it's flattening out, all okay, right? So that's for the long. So the indicator is rising and it's flattening out for the long. And for the red number two, right, to get a short output here, it's when our indicator is falling, but it's not falling as much. So it's it's falling, but it's beginning it's beginning to flatten out on the first bar. Okay. And so uh, if we, if we want to know what the number three is, well, the number three is the, is the area where the indicator is still flattening. Uh, you know, the number three output is going to be in between number two, which is the first bar, in between that until the indicator uh, flips direction, until the indicator goes from up to down. So let's take a look at uh, number three area. <clears throat> right, so here we go. So we can see our our stochastic. Basically, our stochastic is is it's still falling, right? It's still sloping down, but it's but it's flattening out even more and more and more. It's beginning to roll over. So that's area number three, 
right? And so this also is area number three. Our stochastic is still, it's still rising, it's still climbing, but it's beginning to roll over, right? It's beginning to flatten out. So, um, all right, so there you go, Kai. Um, you know, find this page. And <clears throat> there's also a video here as well. So you can watch this video, which will go into much more detail um, for this particular solver. All right. Okay, so let me put this back the way that Kai wants is wanting to detect. So there we go. All right, uh, let me see if there's any follow-up questions on this. Um, let's see, all right. Kai's got some more questions here, but let me just let you guys know. Kai found out that the free version of the RSD is not compatible with Bloodhound. Only um, the non-free version is compatible with Bloodhound. So I guess they must have fixed the RSD indicator for Bloodhound uh, after after I tested it. So, all right. So this is the change of slope for the EMA 55. So yeah, as the EMA 55 is rising, right? It's constantly changing. It's either you know increasing or decre decreasing in its rate of rise, right? Sometimes it'll rise a little faster, and then it'll Right? And then if, when price comes down, our AMA begins to flatten up, even though it's still pointed up, but it flattens out a little bit. So I guess Kai's wanting to try and clean up these signals here. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, we can do that. Um, you know, doing that, obviously, it comes down to a lot of details. You know, how do you know... Um, you know, how, how do you, I guess you kind of have to figure out, you know, when you might want another one, right? So let's just say we want to know this first one, um, but we don't want to know any of the rest, right? So we don't want to see any of the other ones here. All right, so we want to get rid of all the rest. Um, and then we'll get the first right short signal there. As our EMA, huh, look at that, our EMA. Oh, hold on a sec here. Uh, oh, sorry. I went a little too, too fast, didn't I? Uh, let's put the EMA in there instead of the SMA. Okay, um, EMA 55. There we go. That makes a little more sense, doesn't it? Okay, so there the EMA rolled over, and there's and so there's our first bar where the EMA begins to kind of flatten out a little bit, right? Makes sense because price moved up. So let's say. We want to get rid of all these long signals here. Uh, so I think uh, this is what Kai's after. Um, let's see. All right. Um, so we'll, we're going to use a signal blocker. So Kai, without more detail, you know about how you know how you're wanting to block some of these signals here without more detail I'm just going to do something simple so and we're going to use so under the function nodes we're going to use a signal blocker okay, so grab a signal blocker and oops so if we zoom in here we're going to connect our solver to the input Right, and then we'll take a look at the output here. And so let's see, uh, we have to kind of figure out, you know, how many bars 
do we think we need to block for? Um, so probably 100 should be more than enough, I would imagine. And let's see. Um, and just the default settings for the signal blocker kind of did did what I was going to show you here, right? So we got the first signal. The first signal whenever your EMA begins to flatten out. Right? The first signal per direction, per the slope direction of your EMA. Um, right, Kai? So I guess that's you know really all I can elaborate on without knowing more more uh, detailed information. So um, okay, let's see. I think uh, I think I guess that took care of it for Kai. Um, all right. So Frank is asking is you know is is can you control the amount of slope or the amount of angle? Um, of in in the solver, can you control the amount of angle of your indicator that the solver is looking for? And yes, you can. Um, oh, okay. Yes, you you can in the slope solver, Frank, but not in the change in slope. So, all right. So, um, yeah. So, the change in slope solver, you can't. No, there's no setting to control the amount of change right the amount of the angle change um, you know getting back to this image here so you know getting back to this illustration so w when your indicator begins to flatten out by any amount by any amount that is going to fire off right output number two so that yeah you can't there's no adjustment in the change in slope solver to adjust you know how much of a decrease actually qualifies for a number two change in you know change changing um, yeah you can see this solver doesn't have any any parameter settings so but if we go to the slope solver so I'm all, I'll drop a slope solver on here like that And we'll take a look at the EMA slope on here, All right? Since we already have the EMA on the chart, so let's change our indicator over. All right, change our period to the 55, like so. All right, so let's look at the chart. <clears throat> All right, so we can see whenever the EMA's sloping up or sloping down, right, we're getting a long output or a short output. Uh, so let's find some areas where our EMA looks like it's flattening out. Yeah, how about this area right here? Right, doesn't it kind of look like our EMA is flattening out? Um, so we can remove this area where the EMA looks like it's flattening out with the slope solver. So the slope solver has a maximum and minimum slope here. So let's go and put, uh, I'm gonna do one tick here. That might be a little too much. One tick might be too much. But we're on the YM and, oh yeah. <laughs> one tick was way too much. All right, let's go and put down 0.25. So 0.25. There we go. Okay, there's 0.25, and so we can you can see we kind of removed the output right from the EMA indicator when it's flat, right? So no no output when that EMA is is flat is flattening out here. Right? So and you can adjust this you know to whatever you like, you know. So let's take a look at 0.5. 
right so that removed a lot more area here so now that that EMA has to be sloping down all, quite a bit more before you can get an output all right so and if I put 0.1 really lower it down there we go we get more of an output and the indicator has to be really really flat now so, so when you're using the slope solver and you're trying to you know find or you're trying to remove those flat areas like this um, you know the the uh, s the slope amount that you put in here this slope amount it's gonna change according to the instrument right it's gonna change according to the tick size of the instrument so if I switched over to the ES right the ES has a much different tick size and so 0.25 on the ES is going to give me a different result versus the 0.25 on the on the YM. So, all right, Frank. So I hope that uh, answered your question. Yeah. All right. So Frank was talking about the change in slope solver, um, and so now yeah, the difference between like output one. And switching to output two or three, there's no adjustments in there. Um, <clears throat> it's just designed so, like output number two, it's it's designed to find just the very first decrease. So, um, yeah, you know, if if two is two, if output number two. If that's too sensitive, then try output number three, All right? Uh, so you may want to use output number three. <clears throat> so if I bring up our illustration again, right? So output number two is the first bar where your indicator begins to flatten out. Output number three is going to be the second and any bar afterwards where the output begins to flatten out. All right, so try and, you know, so maybe number three might work a little better there for you, Frank. Um, you know, of course, it all it all depends on what indicator you're using, you know, how fast does that indicator move? You know, it'll depend on the instrument, you know, how, how volatile is the instrument to make the indicator move? You know, there's a lot of factors that come into play, you know, when you're trying to figure out, you know, if number one's good or output number three is good. So you just have to do a little bit of testing, you know. So that's what Bloodhound's for. So you can do some testing and, you know, find what you find what works best for you. Uh, so Terry's asking, uh, is there a way to use uh, a multiple of a 15 period ATR? Let's see, 15 period ATR as the minimum slope um, in the slope solver. Uh, yes, you bet. Instead of ticks, <clears throat> yep, we can use an ATR <clears throat> for that. Um, so, all right, let me just uh, let me close down Raven here. Uh, yeah, so let me show you a good way to shut down Raven. You know, this is the preferred way. Because Ninja Trader will kind of clean everything up, right? So you know Raven's in a trade right now, uh, and so a good way to to shut Raven down to make sure everything gets cleaned up is to go to File and then Flatten Everything, and of course that's going to flatten my trade. Um, so just keep that in mind. It's going to flatten my trade, but uh, if I hit Flatten Everything, it closes everything out. And right, and my strategy, or Raven, so Raven also gets disabled. So it's a nice clean way of shutting your strategies down. So that that goes for any strategy, not just Raven, but 
any and all Ninja Trader strategies that you have running. And then I'm going to remove it off of there just to keep things cleaned up in, in Ninja Trader's database. All right, so let's um, uh, let's put Bloodhound back on the chart. All right, so we'll go find Bloodhound down here in the S's. So there we go, and we'll load up today's workshop file. So there's today's file. All right, click OK and click OK. <clears throat> Um, you know, take a note here. You see how uh, Bloodhound's output looks kind of weird? Well, that's because if you look up here at the top of the chart up here, right, you see the pull down menu? Right now, it's set, it's set to no logic, right? No logic is selected. So if I go down here and if I select one of these, then it's going to show that logic template. So, all right, let's. Go in here. So, um, mm -hmm. uh, let me work in a new logic template here. So, um, all right. So I'm going to make a new slope solver on our default time frame which is our five range chart. So let's go grab a, a new slope solver. Connect it up. And we'll use the EMA 55 again. All right, so we have the EMA 55 set in there. And so Terry wants to use an ATR. Um, as the measurement unit. Okay, so we're going to be measuring in ATRs, not ticks. So I've changed our measurement, you know, our measurement units to ATR. Um, let me shut this one down. Okay, so under, we'll, we'll work in the maximum slope area first, right? So it's set to ATR. And we want to change our period to a 15 period. So we'll change that to 15. So we're using a 15 period ATR now. And now you just have to decide, you know, what multiple of the ATR are you looking for? Um, that's probably, <clears throat> this ATR is going to give us a big number. So let's try something like 0.1. Um, 0.1 of an ATR. We'll try that, and also I'm going to need to go in here and change the minimum slope uh, settings. So let's put a 15 period, right? So a 15 period ATR in there, and I'll change this value to 0.1 as well. And let's see what we get. Um, Well, so in looking at our EMA here, there we go. So that that EMA has to have uh, you know pretty good slope on it for it to qualify for a 0.1 ATR. Um, All right, so we're looking at ATR slope. Uh, so it's probably, let's just add a, a zero in there. See how that changes things. And uh, yeah, <laughs> it, it removes quite a bit less. So maybe something like 0.05, 0.05. There. Um, there. So, of course, you know, this is all about a personal preference. So, um, you know, the EMA definitely looks like it's flattening out a little bit. Um, you know, but the, the purpose um, of using an ATR, right, is your ATR adjusts to volatility. 
um, right so your ATR you know since the ATR adjusts to market volatility right what that's going to do is that's going to adjust the amount of flatness that you're trying to cut out right um, let's see ATR doesn't really work too well on a range charts because range charts are designed to cut out volatility within the bar you know so I'd say this is applies more to a minute a minute or a tick or volume based bars but it doesn't really it doesn't apply to range or Ranko bars so a range bar does have some volatility but very little uh, volatility so um, let's see yeah so on a minute chart see I'm trying to find a good spot that might it illustrate the volatility um, yeah that might illustrate how the ATR is adjusting the you know the slope requirement um, you know as to what what determines if our EMA is you know flat or not Hmm. Yeah, maybe this spot right here. We got a couple of bars here that might help illustrate it. Um, yeah. So, right, so look at the slope of this moving average there. You know, it's sloping down pretty good and it's being painted. And then, you know, look at these couple of bars here. Right where the EMA reverses up, right because we had a bunch of uh, pretty volatile long bars here, right, just skyrocketed back up, and yeah, it does to me. It looks like um, stretch this out here. You know, it does look like that EMA did turn up pretty good. Um, uh, you know, but like the second bar didn't get painted. But the this third bar did. Um, now, actually, now nah, I guess I guess that's not quite so easy to see either. But um, I guess the point I'm trying to make is, you know, where it looks like our EMA might be sloping up enough that maybe we should get right a long output there on that bar um, but the reason why it's not is because we had we had a bunch of bars of really volatile really volatile bars in here so these volatile you know these long bars are going to increase the ATR which will increase the amount of slope that our EMA has to have before it gets painted so um, Yeah, this is kind of abstract, very mathematically involved kind of concepts to grasp here. But um, I'm sure Terry understands it. Um, I was just trying to help the rest of you guys understand it. All right. Um, let's see. All right. Yeah, I guess I'll, I'm just going to leave it there because I'm really not finding any good examples to help illustrate this better. Oh yeah, so what uh, what Terry's trying to do is um, is when when using the ATR measurement, right? Kind of the um, the I'd say main purpose for using an ATR type of a measurement. Is that um, it? Is that the ATR is measuring volatility in in ticks? So in theory, you could take this slope solver, you know, that's looking for or that kind of cuts out when you're right. You're, it's cutting out when your moving average is is flat and only shows you when your moving average is really sloping. And so using this ATR measurement, um, Terry's reason for using this is that in theory, 
you can change your instrument, um, change your instrument and change your chart type. And in theory, you kind of get the same, uh, you get the same functionality out of that solver. So in theory, you're going to get like you're, you're going to find the same steep sloping areas and it'll cut out the same kind of flat areas across multiple across different instruments across all the instruments and across different time frames um, so you don't have to go in here and adjust this right so like um, let me throw the other one on here right so remember this other the first slope solver I made used ticks right so ticks you know you have to adjust your slope values when using ticks for different instruments and different time frames and stuff. Whereas Terry's point is that when you're using ATRs, the ATR has a way of automatically um, adjusting to different instruments and different time frames. Right? It'll kind of auto adjust itself. So in theory, once you kind of find, you know, a ATR slope that you like you should be able to you know change to a different instrument and get the same effect All right uh, so let's see why am yeah let me go to oil so that ought to be dramatically different and we'll just take a look uh, and well that flat area is pretty obvious um, you know, these areas right here, well, I guess, you know, that's kind of subjective. Um, I guess when you put your cursor over it, the crosshairs over it, yeah, it does look like it did kind of flatten out there. You know, if you look at the bigger picture, I don't know, it looks like it's still sloping now, but once you kind of put some crosshairs over it, yeah, it does look like it did flatten out a little bit there, flatten out a little bit there. So I guess... Um, yeah, you know, I'd say that uh, you're getting pretty similar results on the oil as you did YM. Right. So, all right. Thanks. Uh, good suggestion, Terry. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, so Kai um, is using the backtest Rankos here. Um, so let me put those on the shirt. <clears throat> All right, so let's um, set a reversal of 10. And <clears throat> I'll set a five brick. All right. Um, okay, so we're going to do this with wave mode on, which is non back testable. Right, so you can't back test with wave mode on, but let's just build the chart. <clears throat> and how about I'll just pull up a second chart and we'll do a comparison So just give me a moment while I get these charts set up. Okay, great. So, um, just a moment. Get this just a, just a little bit more. So I'm just trying to get my charts lined up here as closely as I can.
there. Okay. So if we look at the stochastic, right, so I've got the, uh, sorry, let me back up here. So I've got the SI back test, right, on both charts. One has, this chart here has wave mode on, and the other chart over here has wave mode off, so this is back test mode, right? So you can see these are back testable, uh, and, and the reason why they're back testable is because the opening price is the true opening price of the bar, right? You can see the opening price of these of the chart on the left has not been modified, right? So the chart on the right, you can see the opening price of every bar has been modified, so it gives you that smooth Ranko look, but you know that smooth Ranko look is not back testable, so you know these bars on the left this chart on the left this is back testable because the opening price is uh, correct uh, it's the correct opening price but when you do that right you don't have the smooth looking bars anymore but the close of the bar are the same so since the closing price prices of the bars match if we look at our indicator right our stochastic matches from one chart to the other right and you can see that pretty good with my crosshairs as I move the crosshairs across both charts right and of course I'm moving average you know they're gonna move the same right so um, so Kai to answer your question technically if you're doing a back test with um, the backtest rank goes with them set in backtest mode with wave mode off. Um, this, you know, so this is the chart data that's being that NinjaTrader is feeding to the indicators, right? NinjaTrader is going to use, um, you know, the, the data from the chart, um, you know, however you have the chart set. That's the data that's going to be fed to your indicators. Okay, so um, so if you have your, you know, if you're back testing on a chart, um, back testing on a chart, you know, with wave mode on, then you know this is the price data that gets fed to your indicators when back testing it, uh, right? So that's technically, technically that's what NinjaTrader is doing. So um, and so really what it comes down to is does your indicator use the opening price of the bar um, right so a moving average or a stochastic most indicators use the closing price of the bar so the indicators will look exactly the same if your indicator uses the opening of the bar um, or maybe even the high and low of the bar, then you're going to get different results, right? So if we look at the chart on the right, right, if you look at the bottom of each of the bars, right, the open price and the low, you know, all kind of have this modified price. Whereas if you look at the chart on the left, right, the open price and the low of the bar, is much different. So let's take this this bar for example, right? That bar there, um, which is just a sliver. So basically, what that tells us is price just shot right up. It just moved right up. Um, didn't even pull back at all. It just jumped up four ticks. No pullback. Just shot right up. So I'm going to place that arrow there right and um, so you can see on the other chart right take a look at the arrows on the other chart so slightly different right so you can see the arrow on the let's see oh hold on there we go yeah you gotta be careful um uh, yeah I see there's a there's a couple of bars here that have the same timing 
and so NinjaTrader actually doesn't So this this bar where my cursor's at closed at 27 minutes and 54 seconds. The next bar closed at the exact same time. And the next bar closed at the exact same time. So these three bars all closed at the same time. And even though I'm pointing at the middle bar, um, you'll notice on the this chart over here, this the arrow is actually being put on the wrong bar yeah it's being put on the wrong bar it should be put over here like this so let's keep that in mind right that's kind of a a ninja trader thing when you're trying to synchronize stuff um, and see over here the chart on the right ninja trader once again <laughs> moved my arrow I had it over there um, Let's see uh, here. All right. So where the red arrow, that's that's the bar that we're actually looking at. Uh, even though Ninja's putting the white arrow on the wrong bar, but um, you can. So my point is, right, in backtest mode, this. This bar has no body, right? It's just a flat sliver. So the low price is way up here and the open price is way up here. But the chart on the right where its wave mode is on, right? That is the standard looking Ranko bar. You can see the open price is way down below and the low is way down below. So if your indicators are using the open or the low price, it's gonna affect your indicators. Um, you're right. Using one mode versus the other mode, you know that will affect indicators that use the open or the low or the high price. So that's one thing to be aware of. Right? Is what what price data is your indicators using? Uh, so let's see. Actually, I think I've got a good example here. Let's use the ATR. Right. ATR uses the open. Um, no, the ATR uses, I think, the high, low, and close. Um, yeah, I think so. So just a moment while I get this ATR set up. All right, yeah, we can see that the ATR does look a little different when we're in backtest mode. Strange, it's not letting me put the circle across on the other chart. Well, okay, no matter. Um, we can just use my the crosshairs. So, um, right, you can see that the ATR on the left chart looks a little different than the ATR on the right chart. And that's because the ATR is using the high, the low, and the closing price. And so when, uh, right, so when the Renko bars are moving up, the low price is different than on the other chart. So, all right, Kai, I think I addressed that as best I could. Um, Kai is saying that when, when he adds another EMA 14, he's getting more crossovers with wave mode off versus wave mode on. Um, uh, I'm 
not sure why that would be. Not for not for an EMA. Um, let's see, let's minimize that. And let's just work on this chart here. Uh, so let's get rid of that. <clears throat> Okay, just a moment while I get my chart set up. So let's see. Um, <clears throat> so we've got one EMA on the chart already. Um, let's, I'll add an SMA and just create a a crossover system here. All right, we'll do, I guess, uh, an SMA 20. All right, and another thing, let's see, I've got five days of data, okay. I wanna make sure that the number of days don't change. Um, Let's make a new logic template to work in. Um, all right. Uh, so we'll do a uh, wave mode test. Okay. So I'm just going to create a crossover solver. see what else you've written here Kai um, all right so yeah Kai is asking is it possible to develop a strategy with wave mode on at all um, of course you can sure I mean you can develop a strategy with any bar type doesn't matter what the settings are so the settings you know don't never affect the development of a strategy um, all right so let's we'll connect that up and SMA uh, 20 to an EMA 55. Okay, crossover. Oh, actually, I want to keep that SMA and just change the period to 20. And I want, yeah. Oops. Yeah, that's good. All right, SMA 20 on top, and I'll put the EMA 20 on the bottom. I'm sorry, I said EMA 20. I mean the EMA 55. And let's see. Yeah, there's our crossover points. Um, So we've got that. Okay, so I guess an easy way to count if we have more crossovers. Um, well, here. I can do a simple, a little simple spot check. So if we want to do a simple spot check, I'm going to mark all the signals here. Actually, here, let me. Let me lighten the color up here for a little bit for you guys. So I know those greens sometimes um, they difficult to see. Uh, there we go. So lime's a lot easier for you guys to see. Okay. So let me. I'm gonna mark some long signals and then mark some short short oops, mark some short signals. All right. 
right, so just doing some spot checking here. Now let's go change our bar type, or the bar settings, not change the type, but just turn wave mode off. And let's see. Oh, okay. So let's see. It looks like this is what you're seeing here, Kai. Um, and yeah, so you, we can see that um, things are a little bit different here. Um, yeah, it looks like things shifted a little bit. I wonder. Oh, all right. Yeah, shoot, that's just Ninja Trader doing that. So, once again, if we look at the timing of the bars, I've got a bunch of bars that all have the same time because price just moved so quickly. Yeah, look at that. So, from the arrow, so you see this red arrow that's highlighted right there? That red arrow is at 11.52 and 59 seconds. And all of these bars, let's see, all the way, all the way down to where my cursor is, all those bars have the exact same timestamp. So, um, yeah, that's why my arrows are, are slightly different. Uh, yeah, same thing over here with the the green arrow and the long signal, the same timestamp on the bar. So we'll just kind of have to ignore the arrows getting matched up exactly because um, you know Ninja Trader doesn't put the arrow on the exact same bar it just puts it on the bar by time it uses the timestamp let's go back here okay we do have this cross down we have this cross up and cross down so in spot checking I'm not seeing any difference so uh, there's another way we can do this um, Let's see, I'll put, what I can do is put Raven on here and just count the number of trades. So the number of trades will identify the number of crossovers. So I'm going to load up today's file. And we want to look at this uh, wave mode test. Right, set our entry logic to the wave mode test and <clears throat> let's just um, all right, I'll just put a simple 10 and 10 just to get some signals generated <clears throat> all right so we do have to turn start auto enabled on so that we get back desk mode <clears throat> Right, so we have a backtest mode here, and notice if I turn the this one off, backtest mode goes away. So make sure we got back backtest mode on to true, and um, yeah, all right, we'll just run it. All right, so this is with the bar is set, you know, to uh, back test mode on or wave mode is off so we can do some back testing so let's check the performance report and so we have 189 trades 189 trades all right let's change our bars turn wave mode on All right, and so that will cause um, Raven to do another back test. Okay, let's see, do we have that other? Yeah, okay, cool. We still have the old back test result. So let's go grab a new one. And 
still the same number of trades um, there, Kai. Uh, so, Kai, I don't know why you're getting more crossovers. Um, something else must be happening. Let's see, let me uh, take a look at the comments here. Guys, put some comments in for me. Let's see. Um, all right, yeah, so Kai pointed out. Uh, let's see. All right, just a moment. Uh, let me clean up my chart here. So you notice how these arrows shift a little bit because of the timestamp of the bar. So I bet you, I bet you if I change my bars back to wave mode off, right? So wave mode off is when I actually place the arrows. I bet you they still won't match. Yeah. See, they, they still don't match anymore because... Ninja Trader moved my arrows. Um, gosh, I don't know any way around that. You know, that's a Ninja Trader function. I don't know any way around that. Um, you know, I guess you could manually manually <laughs> count the number of bars. You know, you have to count them. So. Let's see, we got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 14. Um, all right, so we've got um, 14 bars to this long signal here. To the short signal, we've got one, two, three, 13 bars. All right, let's change our bars back. Let's turn the wave mode back on. Mm. Okay, let's see. Do we still have 14? One, two, three. Yep, so oh, that is still on the 14th bar. Um, and this one, one, two, and 13, um, yeah, so at least so that the crossover signals are happening on the exact same bar number, uh, regardless of the mode, and that's what I would expect because the, um, you know, EMAs, any moving average, uh, you know, a standard a typical moving average uses the closing price of the bar. So it wouldn't be affected by, you know, wave mode being on or off. Um, all right, Kai, so, um, you know, what you're experiencing must be s somehow, I guess, an indicator is being affected by either the open price or the higher the low price or something like that. Um, so, um, yeah, and, yeah, I don't think there's anything that can be done about that. Um, you know, just kind of, just kind of, um, um, hypothetically or theoretically speaking, um, I, I don't think. You know, I'm not exactly sure what's causing the problem, Kai, but, uh, you know, theoretically speaking, you know, it's just what you could be seeing is just a functionality of, you know, of um, different prices of the bars, right? When you turn wave mode off, of course, you get different prices on the bar.
So I don't think there's any way that you could ever get around that. If you'd like to see something in a workshop, send me an email. Uh, send me some screenshots if you can. That's very helpful um, as well. So, um, all right, guys. With that, goodbye. Have a great weekend. Thank you.